Good evening. My name is Kit Sheehan. I'll be teaching tonight. I believe I'm teaching, uh, Herman will have to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm teaching uh, next Wednesday and then the Sunday first session and then Herman the following Wednesday he starts on uh, Hebrews. So he'll pick up he, uh, Wednesdays and I'll just stay on the first uh, uh, first uh, uh, session on Sunday. Very good. Uh, it looks like uh, one of my quarters is not is full, so we'll just uh, uh, turn him off. And uh, uh, got the what? Uh, one of the recorders. I have to oh, okay. copy. Uh, uh, I'll have to copy. Maybe I'll take it home and copy the files off. All right. The card is full. So, uh, um, oh, let's see. We got uh, uh, who is who, who's the? We don't know. The lady that uh, needs our prayers. Uh, oh, Phyllis. Uh, no, no. Um, there Leslie. is. Leslie. Uh, no, yeah, the the lady that had intestinal blockage. Oh, oh, Fran. Fran, yes, Fran. Oh, okay. We need to pray for her. Who? Fran. Fran. Not Fran. I don't know anything about an intestinal block. It was on the prayer chain. Well, uh, let me let me go see. But she didn't tell me about that. She's having surgery. Uh, she let me read the email. I'll read the email for you. It says, uh, Rick and Terry Howlett are asking for prayers for Rick's mom, oh, Fran. Dear. She went to the emergency room on Saturday with what turned out to be an intestinal blockage. Fran has been admitted to the hospital and is in, on she pain meds to control well, pain. Not Fran. While, while the, the, they decide to do what, uh, they decide what to do. Uh, they're praying it will be a simple fix versus surgery. Uh, pray for Fran that her pain will stay under control. Uh, that uh, God will comfort her and give her and her doctor's wisdom. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I knew that didn't be the same. Yeah, in some places, uh, um, you've got uh, people with the same name, whether that's like James or Jim or Tom or. Fran, I can't talk to her today. Um, I don't know if that's. Let's be a prayer for Jerry. She's still not. Doing good. Okay, Judith needs a prayers. Okay. And each one of us needs prayer. Um, uh, I guess, uh, what's the next uh, um, milestone for the, the, the children's ministry? Um, uh, slam camp, is that what's next? Or yeah, that's the next thing. The next thing that we're preparing for is slam camp. Okay. Well, I guess uh, I've got lots to, lots to cover tonight, so... Uh, we'll see, uh, um, uh, we'll just go ahead and go into prayer here. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for so many blessings. Uh, we understand that's, that many times uh, uh, suffering or disease uh, is, is for our blessing, or sometimes you put us in a place where we can give the gospel to someone else. So even, even though at the time we don't know, we don't understand, um, we just have to trust you that uh, you have a plan and that we're in it. We pray for Fran, uh, that you'll help the doctors know what to do, uh, help her stay uh, comfortable uh, and uh, uh, relax in, in uh, trusting you. Uh, pray for Herman and Judith, especially Judith, uh, um, help her uh, feel better, um, help her uh, know how to address or help the doctors address what, what, what her pain is. Um, we pray, Father, for uh, uh, each member of the of the congregation. We know that we're all in the in the battle. We're grateful, Father, for our country. Um, we ask you to help guide her. We know there's so many issues, so many problems in the world. We know you have a plan. Uh, we're we're praying that uh, that uh, we could uh, settle down in our country and and get some sanity back to to where it's supposed to be. Um, but we know, again, you have a plan, uh, and we're in it, and so we know you're watching over us. Pray now tonight, Father, that you give me words. Uh, help me uh, explain uh, grace in the, in the book of Judges. Uh, help understand the, the topic of vows. Um, give me the words that I might uh, teach your, your doctrine. Pray that the Holy Spirit will help those who listen understand and be able to apply it as they read the Bible. 
Thank you again, Father. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Um, as, as often happens, uh, uh, as I'm studying the, the book of Judges, I find sometimes it's a word or concept, and I can't just let it go. I've got to stop. Uh, there are sometimes uh, things that, okay, well, we've already covered those, uh, whether that's the angel of the Lord or something else. And, but I got to vows, and I said, well, there's some questions I have here because it, it, a vow sounds like if, if, if you, God, do this for me, then I'm going to do this for you. Well, that's not grace. Um, so what, what uh, uh, and the question I'll ask is what are we missing? Because there's something that's missing. <clears throat> but we'll back up to verse 29. Uh, chapter, just chapter 11, uh, verse 29. From the previous lesson, negotiations between Jephthah and the king of the sons of Ammon failed. There wasn't going to be a peaceful settlement. Negotiations may have been smart, they have, may have been the smart move from a human perspective. Um, why engage in a war if diplomacy can solve the problem? But it's also established uh, Jephthah as the chief of the Gileadites and from the king of Ammon's perspective. And I suppose from the Gileadites' perspective as well, because they, sent, they, they chose him to be the leader and here he is acting as the leader, negotiating with the foreign power. <clears throat> At this point, Jephthah may have realized that he might have been out of his league. If the king of Ammon thought he would lose, then he might have backed down. However, the leaders of Gilead talked Jephthah into becoming the troop commander of a ragtag farmer army to go against the well-trained and well-equipped army of the king of Ammon. I might be overstating this a little bit, but a king will have a trained, trained people and likely a standing army to defend his territory. A ragtag farmer army was in search of a leader, so they picked him. Uh, they had no training and little to no experience individually, but God called him, or, or they, they called him a, a valiant warrior. And we don't have the details behind that. Many people think that he was a criminal. A crook. It doesn't really tell us. He could have been a mercenary. That may be where he got his, his, his uh, 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 expertise. So in, in Judges eleven twenty nine we start, Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. <laughs> then he passed through Mitzvah Gilead, and from Mitzvah Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. So the Spirit of the Lord, this is the Holy Spirit, and we've seen this before. God <coughs> can sovereignly bestow the Holy Spirit on whom he desires, and it's worked up uh, uh, very differently in the Old Testament because God could, uh, there's no, no indication that Jephthah was a mature believer, and in fact there's, there's, many indications that we're on the downward swing here from uh, Othniel, who was uh, the model of, of the, the warrior, the valiant warrior. Uh, you get to, uh, to Brack, who was uh, uh, um, uh, not sure of himself, and then uh, Gideon, who didn't even really understand who God was until he did some tests. And now you've got this uh, guy that was pushed out of his family because his, his uh, mother was a prostitute. <clears throat> But God can uh, sovereignly bestow the Holy Spirit, and so he does. Um, and uh, God's in charge of history. The operation of the Holy Spirit was very different from how it operates today in Christians. The Holy Spirit came upon believers and even unbelievers to accomplish the, the, uh, God the Father's plan. And pass through. Uh, the text doesn't specifically mention the farmer army, but they must have been with it. The Holy Spirit has propelled him forward to the battle lines. Then we get to the, the text that we're going to study tonight. Yeah, I know it's only two chap two verses, but uh, maybe another day we'll go a little faster. <clears throat> so 1130, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatsoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. This vow on its surface is legalistic. Um, and uh, so you, God, will give me the victory, and I, Jephthah, will give it to whoever comes out of the doors of my house. And then God gives Jephthah the victory. Now, uh, there's a lot here. It's, I, I think in the end it will be considered a, a legalistic. But there are other vows, so it's part of a category. So what makes this one different? And, and just because God did something doesn't necessarily mean uh, he was answering the vow. I happened to, to look today at uh, uh, remind something reminded me that uh, 
uh, Catholics will pay will, will pray to different uh, saints. Uh, the saint of the lost and, and stolen things is, is St. Andrew. And I've heard people, and you've seen testimonies online, I prayed to St. Andrew and I found it. He answered my prayer. Uh, 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 it's like that Affleck duck when, uh, 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 and he's out of, there's one, one commercial where he just, he's out of words. And I, want, I don't even have the words to, you know, I might say some bad things, but, uh, um, uh, just because something happens, I mean, you can have it, whether it's a Muslim or a Catholic or, or a believer, uh, just because uh, something happened, uh, wh were you in fellowship when you prayed? Was that according to the will, will of God? Um, and so things can happen that, uh, uh, oh, St. Andrew, he found it for me. Well, I'm not going there. So here I had to ask God to open my understanding of this passage. I didn't know much about vows. Sometimes I have to go dig in the Bible and figure out something before I can teach it. Uh, so, um, I, and I'm probably just going to uh, sketch out some things on vows, uh, probably at the tip of the iceberg. But we at least need to start uh, and 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 ask some questions and look at the text and see what it says. Um, uh, so let me just skip down to uh, the bottom of page two. What does Merrill Unger say in his dictionary? Vow, defined as a religious undertaking, either positive to do something or negative to abstain from doing a certain thing. Under the old covenant, the principle of vowing was recognized as in itself a suitable expression of the religious sentiment and as such was placed under certain regulations. It was not, except in a few special cases, imposed as an obligation on the individual conscience. The Lord never said, Thou shalt vow so and so, but if thou shouldst make a vow, or when thou dost, dost do so, then let such and such conditions be observed. The conditions specified in the law related almost exclusively to the faith, faith, you know, faithful performance of what had been freely pledged himself before God to render in active service or dedicated gifts. He was on no account to draw back from his plighted word, but conscientiously carried into effect, since otherwise a slight would manifestly be put upon God and a stain left upon the conscience of the worshiper. Vows were entirely voluntary, but once made were regarded as compulsory and evasion of performance of them was held to be contrary to true religion. I don't know about you, but that made it about as clear as mud to me. Uh, there's a lot, uh, just, uh, a lot of things, a lot of, leaves a lot of questions unanswered. And now this was written uh, uh, maybe 70 years ago. I don't know. It's no longer when he wrote his dictionary the first time. But, uh, and so sometimes the, 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 the language that he used, I know when I'm reading Ellis Schaefer, that sometimes he goes on and on and on and on. Well, you could have said that in one sentence, um, but that's the way they talk then. Um, and just as I complain about the way people talk today, it ain't the way that I talked when I was a kid. But that's we were stuck with what, what we got our communication. Uh, so I start with some observations, uh, 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 things that we, we know to be true. Grace is God's policy. Uh, grace and grace is everything uh, uh, that God is able to do based upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's a paraphrase from uh, R.B. Thien. That was he came up with that kind of phraseology. God does the work, and man trusts faith or believes. Human righteousness, righteousness is abhorrent to God. In other words, he doesn't like it. And we've seen that in Isaiah 64, 6. Um, uh, God, God's in charge, and we just, we're just along for the ride, but we ride by faith. We trust uh, our uh, uh, dependence on the Holy Spirit. Laws of hermeneutics, because we're going to get into that just a little bit, are just uh, uh, to, to emphasize context, context, context. Uh, Herman told us many times, the three most important laws of hermeneutics are context, context, context. In this case, the context of the Bible is the inerrant word of God. B, the context of the Old Testament under a system of covenants. So it's different in, in the Old Testament than it is now. We're not under a covenant. And C, context of the book of Judges, and in particular chapter 11. And we need to take a side trip here because uh, all everybody talks about there's four covenants that are in narratives that gives some insight into what a vow is. You can go through, uh, there's an extended uh, uh, chapters, a whole chapter in Leviticus chapter 27. I'm not going to go there. Um, 
<clears throat> and as one commentator said, that uh, well, you've got all these things you can read in the Psalms and the Leviticus, but these narratives actually show it in, in work. This is what people actually did, right or wrong. So we got the first one, which is the longest of the vows, uh, is in uh, um, Genesis uh, uh, 28, uh, Jacob's vow. And what I'm going to do is just kind of essentially I'm listing these vows um, and read uh, the, 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 the pertinent uh, verses, and then we'll go into some detail later on. Yes. Now, is this the first time that vow was used? Yes. In the book. Well, the, well, the, I, when I looked up the word the the vow, there's a, a Bible hub which has it's an interlinear. And it has links in there, so it has the word for vow, and I click on that, and it shows a listing of the of the usage, and and the first use was was this passage. Now, um, uh, I I don't, as far as I know, this is the first use in the Bible of, of a vow. But of these, I have these more or less in in chronological order. There's four of, of these narratives, uh, and so these are essentially the four first, I think the four first uh, vows. Now there's some others. But these are the ones that are held up as, as examples because they're extended uh, narrative on, on them. Um, uh, but uh, I wanted to show you the actual vow. The problem is that, and I'll, I'll go ahead and get into this later, is context. Is because what people do is they take these verses, oh, there's the vow, there's the vow. Well, what's the context of that vow? Where does it fit in God's plan? Uh, and I think that's when you put it there and you start to see, oh, well, that may be a little different than what these people are saying. And, and uh, so like uh, 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 Merrill Unger, nobody, nobody wants to indicate uh, 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 grace versus legalism, but I think that, that it's easy for a vow to become legalistic. And I think in Jephthah's case, it was. Uh, I think he had maybe the right idea, but, he, but he, uh, he went about it all wrong. Well, let me go first with Jacob's vow. Uh, then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all of that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. It sure looks like Jacob is saying, If you, God, do this for me, then I'm going to do this for you. Uh, but there's, like I say, for me, I, I think there's something missing. And I think that's the context. Um, then was the second vow was, is Israel in Numbers 21 2 uh, so Israel made a vow to the Lord and said didn't say how they did that if they did that through the priest and the tabernacle it just and like many things in, in, the, in the book of Judges and other places it just says here's, here's the fact it doesn't explain how we got to that fact uh, it just it, so here so Israel made a vow to the Lord and said if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand then I will utterly destroy their cities like like uh, this, like the previous vow, looks like Israel saying, if you do such and such for me, then I will do this for you. <coughs> so what's missing? Like I say, the context. Uh, Jephthah's vow. Uh, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatsoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's. And I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Again, it, uh, it, it's... it's uh, do you think his pet dog would come out that door first? Well, <laughs> I don't know what he thought. It was it was not a good idea to say whatever, and that's that's another that's a point I will make is that if you have a vow, you make things specific, not say whatever, whatever, um, and and uh, um, uh, Robbie Dean did his his thesis on on that vow essentially. Um, and he came to the, well, we'll get to that when we get there. I, I, I got plenty, I'm on page five of 16, so need to make some progress here. So then you have Hannah's vow in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. And, and uh, so we need that. that uh, there's obviously a context that's that's missing from here. What's, what? Why did she pray this? Uh, so uh, when you read through these and you look just at, at that text, you say, "Is God a legalist? Well, man, never be," like Paul says. So what's missing? 
Herman has told us over and over again, uh, context is, the, there's three important, the most three important rules of, of hermeneutics is context, context, context. And so it is here. These vows were taken out of context and meaning read into them. Um, if, you, if you take out the context, well, where do they fit? Why do they do this? Um, and and uh, so we'll look at them in context. Uh, and the first one is in chapter 28. And, and I, uh, I won't have you read the, the, the full chapters in the other other uh, vows, but I want you to open to Genesis chapter 28, and we'll read that, and you can begin to see for yourself the whole context of, of where this is. So I'll read in 20, Genesis 28. Right. Um, yeah. We could do this on, on, online here. Okay, so we're talking about uh, uh, the time of Isaac and Jacob, uh, Jacob being the son of Isaac. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and, and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of, of Canaan. You've got to deal with the advertisements. You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Verse 2. Arise, go to Padam Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent old Jacob away, and he went to Padam Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. <clears throat> now, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padam Aram to take the, to himself a wife from there, and that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padam Aram. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father, Isaac, and Esau went to Ishmael and married, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath and the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Kind of, uh, you, you've, seen, you've seen kids that uh, uh, they, they, uh, they find out what their parents don't want and they go and do that right away. It's happened. <clears throat> then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his dream and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. I don't know if you remember that movie Stargate. Well, here's the, here's the heaven gate. <laughs> so Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey, that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house, and all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth. So, 
So, um, uh, so we read that. So we, the key verses uh, of this context were that uh, uh, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, and, and verse one there, and then he told him to go and get a wife, uh, uh, not from Canaan, uh, and then he goes in and he, essentially he's he's, he's uh, sketching out the Abrahamic covenant or the promise to Abraham, and and it goes from Abraham to Isaac uh, and and uh, then to Jacob. And, and uh, so um, uh, that's the context, that's part of the context of, of what he has done here with his vow. Essentially, he's saying, um, uh, um, if you really are God, and I think uh, there's a lot of things I want to say all at one point. One, but I guess I, let me just follow what I've got written here, because I just want to say so many things right there, all on top of each other. The context is Isaac blessing Jacob, invoking the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, so we, what was that? And here's the promise, a part of that. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Uh, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. This promise was given by God to Abraham in his line. Isaac received confirmation from the Lord. In other words, I'm tracing it. Abraham, here's Isaac, and now it's going to be Jacob. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because, uh, it's page 8. <clears throat> because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Uh, Isaac provides a supplemental break blessing to Jacob, invoking the Abrahamic covenant and the promises in 28.4. Uh, may he also give you the blessing of Abraham. In other words, this is Isaac speaking to Jacob. To you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. So now in Genesis 28, God confirms the covenant, or, or at least the promise, to Jacob in a dream. And he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were descending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie, I will give it to you and your, your descendants. Um, Note the covenant was initially with Abraham and then Isaac, and Jacob is now in next in line. But this is a dream. This is not face-to-face -face meeting with the angel of the Lord. Um, you know, your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth and will spread, next page, out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, your descendants, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Now we can look at the, the vow in context. Uh, uh, then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will uh, give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. Well, God just said, This, this is what I'm going to do. And you may have re remembered, uh, it sounds a lot like Gideon, uh, before Gideon gives God the three tests, the angel of the Lord, the three tests, because um, uh, uh, um, I forget the exact words now, what the angel of the Lord said to, uh, um, uh, to uh, um, uh, Gideon, uh, uh, get up and uh, you're, you're going to save Israel. I don't remember the words, but essentially, and, and uh, he said, what? Me? Who are you? Um, and I think that that was a problem with, with Gideon because he'd been worshiping Baal uh, for who knows how long. And all of a sudden, this, this guy that looks, he looks like a guy. He's really the angel of the Lord. And, he, and he's telling him stuff. And, and well, who are you? And, and so uh, he had two tests. Um, and the first one was uh, uh, where, where he, he, he uh, prepared a meal for him. And then he didn't, the, the angel of the Lord didn't, didn't eat it. And he just... Uh, Cause it to burn, burn up. And then he had to do, so he was stronger than Baal. And uh, um, so he was trying to, well, to, 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 to verify who is this. And um, 
at the bottom, I want to get in the bottom of uh, page nine. Remember, Jacob is involved in deception and lies and cheating. Uh, I mean, his name is uh, often associated with uh, with cheating, lying, uh, uh, and and he had the uh, uh, he he got uh, Esau to sell him his birthright. Uh, usurper. Pardon? Wasn't he a usurper? Yes, usurper. Yes, uh, and then then of course. Uh, uh, by a ruse, he got the the, the, the birthright blessing from Isaac, um, and, uh, and of course he went to when he went to Laban later on. He get he's he gets cheated, and and everywhere he goes is, is there's lies and cheats, and so well here's this guy is he, he it's, it's a dream, and and this guy in the dream says he's God. Well, he, I'll know he's God if he takes care of me, and if he does all this stuff, then then. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, then, then, then he's my God. Um, but uh, I think, the, and, and we have to remember, there was no scripture. There's no written, nothing written down. It's all oral tradition. So it's not like, well, let me go read, let me go find this in the Bible. He didn't have a Bible. Um, and, and I think that sometimes we don't, uh, I know I don't, uh, I have to think twice sometimes about the context of, well, they didn't have scripture uh, until uh, Moses, then they had the Torah. Um, and then we see in Judges that there are people that refer to what's in the Torah. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had to deal directly with God. Um, and they had to have direct revelation because there wasn't anything written down. And, and uh, so and I think at some points they had doubts. Is this really God? Is that God really going to tell me to, to, to go and, and, uh, and do this? Um, and that, that was what, what Gideon encountered. So we have no scripture. Let's see, this is page uh, 10. Um, uh, he had the words of his father Isaac, but that was that sufficient. But eventually, uh, after God actually did uh, what, what uh, he had promised, you know, God is faithful. And, 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 uh, um, so then in Genesis 35, uh, Jacob comes back to this place. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and live there, and make an altar there to God, and will appear to you when you flee from your brother Esau. That's the Genesis 28, chapter 28 passage. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the four gods which are among you, and purify yourself and change your garments. In other words, they had four gods in their house. So, so he said, We've been worshiping all, all these different gods. Well, God, God came through. He proved himself. He proved who he was. So uh, put those gods away and what God, Yahweh will be our God. Uh, and Gen uh, chapter, verse 3, And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had, and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near, near Shechem. And uh, we saw that in, in Judges, in this, this narrative with Jephthah, um, that uh, at, at some point the, the, the Gideon, Gileadites uh, put away their foreign gods. It's kind of like they're screaming to God, help me, help me, and they have all these foreign gods in their hands, in their pockets, and, 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 and God says, I don't think I'm going to help you. Oh, okay, well, we'll get rid of these other ones. How's that? <laughs> so, uh, uh, that? So that's what happened here with Jacob. Get rid of your foreign gods. And they can't, I mean, even with Jacob, they, they couldn't get rid of them. Uh, and here they buried them, apparently, so that's good. Um, so uh, just some observations. And again, I'm just touching the, the surface here of, of some of this. I, I'm sure that uh, if we were to really dig down deep into vows and that go to, through every pass, I think the verb is used like four, 60 times. Um, and uh, um, so... Uh, so I'm just touching the surface, so, but I'm making some observations here. Maybe it'll help us get further. Like I said, Jacob had no written Torah to consult. There's no written guidance from God during Jacob's time. Uh, there may have been uh, the book of Job, but I don't think that uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had access to that. We don't know when that became into the, the, uh, the Hebrew or the, the Jewish uh, uh, corpus of, 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 of literature or of, of biblical scripture. Um, all information from God either came directly from him or through oral tradition, which had originated in Revelation to someone else. 
Jacob had to depend on oral tradition passed down from Abraham to Isaac and then to him. And the, and the culture, uh, page 11, of the Old Testament is, is to show your faith rather than just to say you, you have faith. We've seen that in, in uh, the book of James. Uh, you say you've got faith, well, show me your faith. So uh, then point two, oh, and what was, uh, what was the point I was going to make here? Um, so in today, uh, we depend on the written word and, and less on the oral tradition. And that's where some, some uh, religions or some uh, forms of Christianity have perhaps gotten off track. Um, I think the Catholic Church depends a lot on oral tradition. Um, I can remember having a Bible study or being attending a Bible study after I became a believer in the Catholic Church and we were studying the Bible and the, the bishop comes walking by and sees us uh, studying the Bible so oh that's nice but you really ought to study canon law that's where it's really at well so that's so that has to do with more with tradition and and less on on God's word and uh, um, so the, 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 it used to be only oral tradition was available but now we've got the full the full complete Bible and the oral tradition has been uh, been passed down so many times it's been corrupted so uh, it, it, if it varies from what's written down here well then uh, we wouldn't follow that I wanted to take you to hear that kind of statement made by the, the uh, priest mm -hmm. uh, to realize this this just isn't where I need to be well I was a new believer and and so I was trying to deal with many different things and and uh, was thinking, well, I'll go back and take take my faith with back to the Catholic Church. But uh, that they're so um, they're, I can go on for an hour on on some problems in that church. But uh, um, I I went back and I saw what the, and the part of the problem was also that that they were the uh, the Catholics in that Bible study were charismatic. Uh, Catholics. Uh, so uh, this was in, 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 uh, at Florida State in Tallahassee, and uh, there was such a variety of different kinds of people there. Uh, you had demon worshipers and covans, and 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 uh, uh, you had uh, the charismatics, uh, many different groups of them, and of course you had the the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians, and, and then you had Campus Crusade and InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and. And uh, so uh, navigating that as a new Christian was, was a challenge. Um, and uh, at, at one point I, I went, and there was a, a Bible study that uh, a friend of mine, uh, well, he became a friend, was teaching. Uh, he, had some, he had these notes from some Bible teacher and, and he was teaching and I thought, this is great stuff. And, and, uh, but I decided I wanted to get rid of the middleman and where, where was he getting his stuff? Oh, this guy, Arby Thiem in, in Houston got tapes so I started reading getting the tapes and uh, I'm afraid that there was a semester or two that I wasn't doing so well because I was listening to tapes all day <laughs> so but I found it was helpful in understanding uh, what, what a Christian is and and, and does and, and what's right and what's wrong uh, what's what's uh, human righteousness as opposed to, to to God's righteousness so enough on that uh, Point three, um, oh, let's start with point two. Uh, the narrative set in the context of the Abrahamic covenant promises. Isaac had passed that on to Jacob as a blessing. Then God gave Jacob a dream confirming Isaac's blessing. Now Jacob is referring back to God's promise. Jacob is saying that assuming God holds up his end of the promise, then Jacob will trust God. And the point was, that by holding up his end of the promise, he's demonstrating who he is. Um, uh, that he controls history uh, and so if uh, uh, he knows that he is God I, that's how I see it now I'm sure other people might might disagree but um, based upon uh, that context um, that you're next in line uh, for this this promise uh, and and you, your your descendants will be uh, uh, there'll be many 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 descendants like the stars of the sky and and so this is perhaps a little bit much for this guy to take in, um, and he had he perhaps hadn't been really paying a lot of attention to what uh, Isaac is saying as far as God and um, like I say there was no written scripture, so uh, okay uh, I need to know that this this God is really who he says he is, and if he is well he's my God, 
And well, that's what he did in, in, in chapter 35 of Genesis. <clears throat> and so this passage in, in, in the, uh, point four, this passage that Jacob had not picked a deity was going to follow. It seemed like, like I say, like Gideon a little bit. He had received the blessings from Isaac by Ruth. He did not merit them. So how would he know that God is not involved in Ruth against him? The wording reminds me of Ruth's statement of faith uh, uh, in uh, uh, chapter one of, her, of Ruth. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse if anything but death parts you and me. And and everybody looks at Ruth, and, and rightly so, that uh, uh, she was in the line of David. Uh, but I think that uh, people don't don't uh, give Naomi uh, enough credit. Uh, why why did Ruth become a believer? Because of Naomi. Certainly the the husbands weren't weren't. Uh, uh, they went off and and uh, outside of Israel and married uh, uh, Moabites. Uh, which they weren't supposed to do, and they ended up dying, perhaps sent to death, who knows. Um, and uh, uh, so Naomi's left with, with Ruth and uh, one other, the other uh, uh, wife of the, the dead son. And, uh, but I would, would guess that it was because of the, the what do you call it, the uh, testimony of your, of your life, uh, that uh, uh, Ruth saw Naomi and understood that there was something special about her God. Um, anyhow, now to point six in Genesis chapter 35, Jacob has the family put, bury the foreign gods, idols, and other pagan god items uh, out. In other words, he got rid of foreign gods, and now he's making good on his commitment. God truly is a God who is in charge of history. He is the God. So Jacob has now picked the God he will trust. Now He now shows his faith. Until Genesis chapter 35, his family had their idols of foreign gods. Then he found that the Lord Yahweh was indeed truthful and faithful. So he said he is now the God of Jacob and his family. Uh, point seven, the Genesis chapter 28 passage is less of a deal made with God than a recognition of the Abrahamic covenant blessings and Jacob's commitment of, uh, to faith worship of Yahweh. It may even be like Gideon's test of God. Gideon didn't know who he was talking to until the angel of the Lord passed both his tests. Here's some, uh, I have a, a commentary on Genesis by Bruce Watke. Um, it's not uh, technical like I'd like, but it does have some insight sometimes, and sometimes you stumble across something. That's, that's really insightful. <clears throat> so here's from, from Bruce Watke, uh, talking about this, this particular vow. This is the longest vow in the Old Testament. In Brueggemann's words, vows are not contracts or limited agreements, but yieldings that reorient life. Now, I know that the theme didn't like the word yield, uh, but I think the, I, I think, was it Romans chapter 6? Uh, there's the yield or something. Uh, but the idea is that you don't, uh, you, you, you uh, don't stick to your sin nature. You don't say, I'm going to do this. You yield to the Holy Spirit in, in that in that respect and, and uh, depend on Him. Um, but I think that that's. Uh, let me read that again. The vow uh, um, uh, uh, vows are not contracts or limited agreements, and that's that. If it was, then you say, well, then then that's a that's a. Uh, if you do this, then I do that. Uh, but yieldings that reorient life. Regarding Jacob's vow, Ruth comments: the vow reorients Jacob's journey. The journey had originated as flight to avoid assassination and a trip to find a wife suitable to his parents. Now, however, Jacob's journey becomes a pilgrimage with theological content. He goes to the same place for much the same purpose, but now he travels as a carrier of God's promises and with divine assurance of aid. In turn, accompanied by God's traveling mercies, Jacob had committed himself to living with Yahweh as his God. The promise and the vow of transform Jacob's journey, as surely as an encounter with God, changes a stony place into a sanctuary. On vows, Waukee says, the Old Testament looks with favor upon making well-considered realistic vows. Isaiah prophesies of a golden age with Egyptians, well, when the Egyptians will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The vow which aims chiefly to secure the Lord's aid in crisis is a vital part of Israel's worship. The Mosaic law provides for votive sacrifices and frequently to royal psalmists 
make or pay vows as part of their petitions and thanksgivings. Page 15. These vows also signify a commitment to continue a relationship with God, even after being delivered from adversity. The Lord looks with favor on Hannah's vow to offer her son to God for life, if he takes away her reproach of being barren. And with her vow, she indirectly delivers Israel from the Philistines. Although vows are not required, once made, they have to be kept. Now, I'm, the next few vow, uh, the next vows, uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend as much time on, and I've, I'm, I'm running out of time here, so uh, I'll, I'll try to keep to the point. Uh, in Numbers 21.1 Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Um, in line, all that you said, what you're working on, what we just read, are you pretty safe with taking uh, Walkie says the uh, let's see yeah, the Old Testament looks with favor upon making no, uh, well considered realistic. No, no, no. 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 Uh, up above there, uh, in uh, River Gardens, uh, words. Wow. That was very clear. Is that pretty solid? That's that's what I um, uh, I would tend to agree with that. I might not say it the same way, but okay. I, I would. Uh, um, uh, I. I I don't like the what when they say, well, if this, then that. Um, I mean, if you take it out of the context, it certainly looks that way. It's like a contract. I'll do this, and you do that. That's why I like the way that it just says uh, vows are not contracts, are limited agreements, but yielding the uh, reorient of the, the lid. That to me is very clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. And and, and uh, that that. That's why, why, why I had this uh, uh, excursus, this, this, this journey through the vows, is that uh, it looks, it certainly looks like if you take the vow out and look at it, it looks like it's legalistic. You do this and I do that, uh, and, and I don't think that it, that's what the words uh, may may look like they say. But in the context, when you say, well, okay. Uh, uh, it, it's almost like, uh, like I say, uh, uh, Gideon's test of God, because he didn't know who he was. Um, and in this case, uh, in, knowing back uh, Jacob's background, full of lies and deception and, and uh, uh, usurpers, uh, that uh, uh, is this God? Is he is he being straight with me, or is, in other words, he's he's looking at the character of God. Uh, if God can do that, then then He's really God. I, that that's my perspective. Okay. Um, Numbers twenty one one. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, then he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. The Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. Then they utter, utterly destroyed them and their cities. Thus the name of the place was called Hormah. Um, so the, that, that text by itself is not really the complete context uh, because you've got to understand that they've just been taken out of Israel or out of Egypt. Um, God has given them uh, um, a direction. Um, now they haven't, he hasn't spelled out uh, everything Clearly, uh, as he does later, as far as you have to destroy everybody and everything for certain places, uh, but he said these are your cities, and so what he's so what's happening here is is uh, if you would delete indeed deliver this people into my hand, well, God's already said He's going to do that. So here, God has a promise. Okay, we're going to we're going to take you up on that promise, and and what what if you take the cities, uh, the the normal thing is to destroy them. Um, and eventually God actually says that and I wanted to, to kind of look at this further because there's a lot of details that uh, uh, I'd like to bring in but I just, I just don't have time I, I remember uh, reading a number of uh, uh, master's thesis in, in, the, in the seminary the Dallas Theological Seminary Library uh, I, I was fascinated with reading some of those and, but a lot of them they put this little phrase in there that, uh, you, there's not enough space here to go into all the details of this and this and this and this and this, but we gotta kind of 
focus on just one thing. So uh, that's what I'm doing here. Um, you must understand at the bottom there, page 13, you must understand that God had given Israel promise of the land. They were expected to fight and win in order to take possession of the land. If they trusted God by obeying his instructions, then they would be blessed. If they failed to trust God, trusting in themselves, they would fail. I'm keeping comment on Israel's vow short. Uh, were I to dig in it, there would be more details than I could cover in an hour. I'm going to skip over Jephthah's vow for now and deal with Hannah's vow. Uh, and I quote from, uh, there's a Jewish encyclopedia, uh, and I, I, quote, I quote from them online. Sometimes I like to get something from the Jewish perspective, and sometimes they have, uh, especially the Old Testament, they may have a perspective that's helpful, uh, or the way they say it. Uh, there are six stories of barren women in Hebrew Bible. Three of the four matriarchs, Sarah, Re uh, Rebecca, and Rachel, Hannah, mother of the prophet Samuel, the anonymous wife of Manoah, mother of Samson, and the great woman of Shunem, also called the Shunammite, an ac acolyte of the prophet Elijah. So the, the, in, for Sarah, then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Rebecca. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Rachel, then God remembered Rachel and gave heed to her and opened her womb. And Hannah, uh, and I, I quote uh, first from 1 Samuel uh, 1, 5, because that gives us uh, some context there. The Lord had closed her womb, I underlined the Lord. If she understood that, that this was from the Lord, now she's got to go to the Lord and say, okay, uh, what gives here? So in, in uh, uh, verse 11 of that chapter, she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, in other words, she's barren, and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, that I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and the razor shall never come on his head. So assuming under, Hannah understood the grace precedence of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, and each one of those had been barren, just like she was. So there's a template or a, or a, or a paradigm. Um, she would have known that A, God, the Lord had closed her womb, B, ans God answers prayer, and C, God had a plan, and perhaps a very special plan for any child she bore in response to her prayer. As a, re as a result, she dedicated her expected son to God. Now, if she understood that uh, these other the matriarchs and certainly she from oral uh, oral oh, from Hannah she might have had the Torah, <clears throat> but even even oral tradition she would have known, uh, uh, and, and certainly when you, when you have an affliction you sometimes um, uh, um, associate in your mind with uh, uh, somebody else that's that's had that affliction, um, so. You, you, you learn about those people, and, and perhaps she did, and she understood that uh, these women were barren for a reason, um, that God was going to grace them in a special way. So she, okay, uh, each of those, those sons were, were special people in God's plan, and so, okay, God, um, uh, uh, I, I, I'm... Um, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, but anyhow, she, she uh, uh, goes back to those as, as a uh, paradigm. Uh, God's going to bless me, um, and I will make a vow here that uh, uh, understanding that that, that uh, son will be special, then he, he belongs to God. Yes, do you have a question, Steve? Well, no, I was just going to make a comment off the top of my head. The vow, like with the, with the ladies here, let's put it like that, it's almost what I would consider like a precedent. You know, I've seen yes. this happen with you. Yeah. Can yeah. you please help me out? And I, you know, to me, to me, the vows are not how can I say ambiguous. They're pretty, pretty clear. Like you yeah. said, yeah. in the context. Yeah. You know? But I, I look at it like as a precedent. You know. Yeah. It's like you know, like we do. You know, hey, guy, he helped me here. Well, damn, I think you can help me over here because yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. Precedent. That's a good word. Now, Jephthah's vow. Uh, the context. Of the vow is man's efforts to defend against the king of Ammon. Uh, early on in the uh, in this narrative, when God is frustrated with uh, with Israel, I mentioned that uh, they say, "Oh God, help us!" And uh, 
Uh, he said, I'm not going to help you. Oh, okay, well, we'll put away our foreign gods. Well, <laughs> you were supposed to already put them away. And now you're saying you, you kept them and then you came to me for help? Uh, it's like, kind of like when you're, when you say you're going to do something, you have your fingers behind your back crossed or something. <laughs> sure, I'll, I, I need your help, God. <clears throat> um, so the, the, the Gileadites, Continuing in that paragraph, the Gileadites did not inquire of the Lord. They did not seek his will. They were going to accomplish this on their own. God had already imparted the Holy Spirit to empower Jephthah. However, Jephthah now may have been expecting God to answer his vow. There was precedent in previous deliverers. Note that the Israelite vow previously mentioned is in the same chapter of Numbers as the defeat of King Sihon that Jephthah relates to the king of Ammon. We saw that uh, there, there was a story that uh, um, when... Uh, Jephthah's negotiating with the king of, of uh, Ammon. He, he tells the story about uh, Sihon and and the, the territory that the king of Ammon said, well, that's mine. And uh, Jephthah says, well, it wasn't yours. It was before, but King Sihon, his people, they conquered it from yours. So you need to go, you, 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 and then he attacked me. So now I've, I've got his land. It wasn't your land to start with. I mean, way back then it was. I mean, you have the same thing with the, uh, with the uh, United States. Well, whose land is it? Uh, well, it's the, whoever owns it now. Um, yeah, and there are always uh, complaints about, well, this belongs to the Indians. Well, are we all supposed to go back to England or France or Germany? Uh, it is what it is. And that, that's, a, that's a problem with, with history. It keeps marching forward um, uh, as, say, like Northern Ireland, where, where uh, uh, English were brought in to replace people or, or say, in the Samaria people were brought in to replace the exiles, uh, um, and uh, uh, that's just uh, the way history is. You can't you can't undo uh, history uh, in most cases. So, uh, but I found it interesting. It's in that same chapter that you have the that, the vow of Israel. So you wonder if uh, if as part of oral tradition, um, uh, well, or Torah. That's right, because Jephthah's got the Torah now. Um, but he, he apparently understands, some of these people understand history, but they don't understand doctrine out of that history. <clears throat> um, Jephthah made, uh, continuing there, uh, uh, Jephthah made the vow to God, but what he vowed to offer God was not specific. Uh, it did not, and it did not mesh with God's plan. It end, indeed, it ended up being human sacrifice. This was wrong. This appears to have been legalism on Jephthah's part. So on this particular vow, you may say it is, it is, uh, um, uh, it's wrong, whether you call it legalistic or not. Um, he's already got the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's got the Holy Spirit uh, given to him to, to make him successful. Um, and, but now he's making a vow. If you do this, then, then I'll do that. And, and what, because his vow is not specific, whatever comes through my door, uh, uh, that's what I'll, I'll give him as a burnt offering. Uh, okay, so now it's his daughter. Uh, uh, well, um, and you know that the vows, you can't go back on a vow. Who's got to do the vow? Well, that's a, that, the uh, human sacrifice is a Canaanite kind of thing, not, not a, a, uh, a, a Hebrew thing. Um, so I made some points. Oh, this, and this, I'll, I won't just about make it. Uh, <clears throat> Now, I don't want to claim that these points are all-encompassing, but it's just some things to consider when we're talking about vows. Uh, vows are made to God, at least in this context of the Bible. Vows are voluntary. Uh, that should emphasize the grace perspective of it. They're not something that's required. It's something that you do on your own. And if you do it in the context of, of uh, God's promises, then, then it's not legalistic. So vows once made must be kept. If God is faithful, then the person making the vow must follow God's lead and also be faithful. Vows, vow offers should be specific. They shouldn't be worded, whatever comes through my door. Um, it should be something specific. Vows must be made in the context of God's plan. They are based upon promise or precedent, as Steve was saying. I do not see vows such as offered in the Old Testament as applying in the Christian age. Uh, we're not under the covenant system. Uh, we have the scripture, um, so I don't, I, I don't see uh, vows um, 
the, the way they're done here in the Old Testament as applying to Christians. And, um, Jephthah has not been conversing with God. Instead, he has been trying to solve the problem of man's, from man's perspective. It appears that this was a bad vow. I would not say that the victory, uh, God, uh, that the victory God gave answering uh, was a, was answering Je Jephthah's vow. It was his plan all along to deliver Israel. God just needed a man who, would, in a crisis, would for a short period trust Him to deliver Israel. In spite of his shortcomings, Jephthah did trust God even if for a short period, as is evidenced by his name in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Uh, that's what I got. Any questions? Yes. yes. In, in uh, Hannah's vow, why would she uh, ask for her son and say that she would not put a razor to his head? Is she referring to the beard? Or because we know there's scripture that says men should not have long hair. Well, it, it may have been uh, referring to the Nazarite vow. Um, and I think you covered that in your, your series on, on Samson. That essentially this is what's called the Nazarite vow. Um, that they don't drink any, anything related to grapes, no wine. Uh, they don't, they're not around dead things and they uh, don't cut their hair. So that's what Samson... Uh, and, and so essentially that, that's what she's referring to. She doesn't say Nazarite per se, but by, by saying not cut, her, cut his hair, that indicates that that's where that came from. Um, so it's a special, uh, special vow of, of, of dedication uh, to God. Okay, let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for tonight. Thank you for your word. Help us to understand uh, uh, day by day uh, as we read uh, and be able to apply to our own lives. Again, we pray for our country um, that you would help straighten it out and help people turn to you as a, a source of, of blessings and goal uh, and purpose. Thank you again, Father, for some Christ's name we pray. Amen. Still don't understand though why God would honor her wish. Would you quit for and give him?